Welcome to Dirt Man Talking. Tonight's story, we take a trip down memory lane, but with a brand new 2023 recording, as we start to get back into the David Holly sagas of twists and turns and terror. Of course, as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story and title. The Stalking Terror. Let's get straight into that. William Anglin was of Cherokee and Irish heritage. His father was half Irish and half Cherokee. He was tall, a slender man with an easy smile and an easy-going attitude. His wife Kate was a nice-looking girl who preferred working on a farm over working in town. She wore little of any makeup, and she was, as many remarked, more tomboy than young female. She and William had been married for nearly three years when they bought their home, a small two-room cabin at the end of a paved farm and market road. The cabin was surrounded by tall, thick-trunked pines and large red oak trees. Cold, clear spring water fed the creek that ran through their property, and white town deer fed on the rich green grass in the same meadow as William and Kate's few head of cattle. Now William worked hard. He worked part-time in a feed and grain supply. This job paid a few bills that they had, and to keep the boys in diapers. He and Kate had been blessed with two sons. Jack and Joshua were twins. Not identical, but they were indeed twins. Will and Kate were happy that they were healthy. The country air Will often remarked would be good for them. Besides working in the feed and grain store part-time, William was also a skilled trapper and hunter. And during hunting season, he always filled his license. There was always fish to be caught in the creek. On cold winter's mornings, he'd awaken before daylight to milk one cow that they kept and put hay out for the rest of the cattle. Then he'd gather his traps, baits and a good gun and begin running his trap lines. And shortly after sunrise, he returned to the cabin, skin the animals he'd trapped, wash his hands and sit down to a meal of hot cakes, eggs, fried bacon and coffee. And Kate would feed the boys and join him at the table for coffee. Ah, you should eat something, Kate. He'd always say, and she would sip her coffee and smile. Once in a while, she would remark that she'd cook her egg later on. Will just shook his head and grinned. I gotta get to work, Kate. Hey, stay close to the cabin today. Looks like we might get some rain. And that could turn into something else by this afternoon. I'll let the boy sleep a little longer and bring some wood inside. Usually right about the weather. He was pulling his work coat on and asked, Have you seen any, uh, any deer in the meadow the last few days, eating that winter wheat? And Kate paused and cocked her head in thought. I come to think about it, I haven't. Well, that's strange, isn't it? Well, maybe the Spencers are putting grain and corn out for the cattle, and the deer are visiting them. I gotta go. Give the boys a hug for me. Will pulled his old work truck out onto the road and drove down the road on his way to work. Kate sat back down at the table and poured herself another cup of coffee. Will had left a couple of strips of bacon on his plate. She chewed thoughtfully on them. She hasn't, in fact, seen any deer lately, and the cattle were grazing closer to the house. In her mind, she was thinking a large predator might have strayed into the area and had everything spooked. Oh, Kate Anglin, you're letting your imagination run away with you, she thought. And Will would have seen and heard a big predator. And sighing, she rose from her table, pulled a sweater on, and went out the back door to bring him firewood. Her old single-shot shotgun was propped in a corner next to the door. And she paused, looked at it thoughtfully, and decided that she didn't need it just to carry wood into the house. And the beast was crouched among the heavy brush. It had been feeding on a rabbit it had ambushed only minutes before, when it caught the sound of the door opening, and Kate Anglin coming out of her back door, moving to the woodpile, malevolent yellow eyes following her every move. It slowly and quietly rose on its hind legs. It wasn't aware it had growled, but the woman must have heard it, for she looked in his direction. And she had not seen him. Her arms were loaded down with wood, and she disappeared back through the doorway. 
An ancient instinct stirred in his chest. Here, its savage brain told him, was easy prey. It was about to step out and go towards the door, when she emerged again. Only this time, she carried one of the hateful guns. Ah, oh, yes. The beast knew what a gun was. It made a sound like thunder and spat fire. But they couldn't kill him. He had been shot before. Hurt before. But generally, his wounds were healed within a few days. No, the beast decided. Better the meal he had now than the one he might receive an injury from. Reaching down, the creature picked up the rabbit's body and silently melted back into the forest. What are instincts? Quite simply, they are feelings. All creatures possess them in some form or shape. They warn of danger. They urge you to travel down one road when you really wanted to travel down another. Instincts tell us when to share burdens, when to ask for favours. They also warn us when we should not camp on the side of the road in an area you know nothing about. And the beast had fed well, and during the late afternoon it had stalked and ambushed a wild hog as it slept. Long, sharp claws and teeth, powered by the beast's pure savage fury, had got him a tasty meal. But this meal wasn't enough. Its savage, primitive brain recalled the house in the clearing, and of the female. Yet the beast remembered that there was a gun there also. Guns could hurt them, but so far, all the creature could recall was after a short time its body would heal itself. Still, it would remember the spot and return to it, if its food supply began to run low. Now Steve Cox was angry, angry enough to do something he'd never done before. He was going camping alone, the night before the opening day of deer season. Now Steve loved the outdoors. He fished, he hunted, and he camped in the wild, but never alone. And here it was, November, the Friday before opening day. And for weeks, he and his two amigos had drank beer and planned their opening weekend hunting and camping trip. Now Steve assured his friends he'd done the pre-season scouting, and he knew where there was a fair-sized herd. He knew the owner of the property, and the man agreed to let Steve and his friend hunt on the property. But there was one very important stipulation. They could not camp in the tree line. The Cox had thanked the gentleman, but the stipulation, why, well, it was strange. And so, he asked the landowner why they couldn't camp in the tree line. Ah, Steve, the property owner said. I was out there maybe a week or so ago. I just didn't feel comfortable. I own land and it's been in my family for years, but, well, something, I just wasn't quite right. I didn't hear anything, or well, that was strange. Normally, I'd have birds chirping, squirrels running all around and chattering and barking, and I'd usually see three or four good head of deer. But this time, huh, nothing. Like I said, it just don't feel right. Now you can hunt it, I doubt you even see a deer, and you can camp on that old abandoned logging road. One's beside my property at the north side of my property. But do not make a camp inside my tree line. If something were to happen to you or your friends, I don't believe that I could stand it. Yes, sir. No camping inside the tree line. I promise. Steve suddenly cursed his friends for not standing up to their girlfriends when they found out that their guys were planning on camping out in the woods the night before opening day. Why, the girls asked. Well, who's going to take us to the hunter's bar or the club if you're camping? And Steve's friends relented and told them they had to take the girls to the club. But they promised to show up at a deer camp by 4.30 on the Saturday morning, if he had coffee. Still, it chafed Steve's backside. He just never enjoyed camping alone. And as he drove out of the town towards the land, he was planning on hunting on. He spotted Will Anglin, loading feed into a customer's pickup truck. He honked and waved and Anglin waved back. Steve thought about going back and asking Will if he'd like to come and camp with him, but decided Will probably had plans already. Now the spot Steve chose was indeed along an old abandoned logging road. These days, it was really no more than a trail, as no logging had been going on for years. He pulled the truck over to a likely-looking area and began to look around. He began unloading the truck and setting up his camp. He thought it was strange that he'd seen no deer cross the road as he was driving in. Now he began to notice other things, like how still the forest really was. There were no sounds, no movements, save for the wind softly blowing through the treetops. 
Steve's inner child, or I was nagging, and then started screaming in his head, begging him to swallow his pride and go back into town. Go to the hunter's ball, and no one would know it got him frightened. Come back in the morning and come back with friends. Well, he stubbornly shook his head and told himself aloud, I hope I never see those guys again. And a large T-bone steak sizzled in the cast iron skillet. And Steve sprinkled salt and pepper all over it. It smelled delicious. And he knew there were two more such steaks like this one that was cooking in his ice chest. And they had been intended for himself and his two buddies. And the beast crouched among the trees and brush, observing the lone camper. The aroma of the cooking steak was driving the beast crazy with hunger. It began to slowly draw closer. A twig snapped under the beast's foot, and it froze. The man jumped out of his chair, looking all around. Hello? He called out. Who's there? He picked up his rifle and began stepping away from the fire. The beast could smell the man's fear, hear the man's heart pounding in his chest. I I'm not joking or playing around. I've I got a British 303 in my hands. I, I will shoot. The beast rose to its full height and roared. It sprang forward covering the 20 or so feet effortlessly. And Steve Cox could only utter, Dear God! He tried to turn and run, but the beast grabbed him by the back of his neck. It closed its massive jaws down on Steve's throat. Teeth like steak knife severed the throat area, and Steve's head rolled onto the ground. The beast dropped the body and began to devour the man's body. William Anglin had shot and killed a nice four-point buck shortly after sunrise. he just finished dressing it out when he and Kate heard a car pull up into the yard. Will, with coffee cup in hand, walked over to the front door. And opening the door, he saw Sheriff Larry Cahill standing in front of the cabin steps. Ah, morning, Larry. Morning, Will. And he removed his hat. Morning, Kate. Kate stepped out onto the front porch, standing beside Will. This is an unexpected surprise, Larry. To what brings you out? asked Kate. Uh, I need to talk to you, Will. Uh, there's been a death. Will stepped aside and motioned towards the door. Uh, let's talk inside. It looked like you could use a drink. And Kate looked closely at the sheriff. He looked troubled. He looked like he needed a drink. You had your breakfast this morning, Larry? We got plenty. Uh, uh, thank you, Kate, but, but no. Well, uh, maybe something to drink. Kate smiled. Uh, coffee? Water? Or maybe a touch of something stouter? Uh, just a, a shot of whiskey, if you can spare it. And Will produced a pint of whiskey and poured the sheriff a drink. And Will and Kate sat back down at the table. So, who died? Yeah, Steve Cox. I just saw him late yesterday afternoon. Drove by the store on his way out of town. He waved and I waved back. Will swallowed his coffee and leaned back in his chair. So, uh, how'd it happen? Climbing a tree or going through a fence or shot by an overzealous hunter who shot up movement? Cahill shook his head no. Uh, none of the above, William. God, I wish it were this simple. No, looks to me like he was murdered. And Will sat upright, looking at Kate. You said murder? As in, someone shot and killed poor Steve? Uh, no. He looked at his empty glass and looked at Will. Uh, would it be possible? Of course, said Kate as she poured the sheriff another drink. Uh, thank you again. He drained his glass and continued. Uh, no, it uh, looks to me like someone took a chainsaw to him. He put his hands over his face as if he were trying to forget the images he'd seen. They cut his head off. Kate gasped and turned her head. Will was no longer smiling. And then the sheriff continued. He was torn apart, Will. I seen some bad shit in my life, but nothing like this. Grady Williams, as that game warden, says he believes a cougar found his way into this part of the country. Uh, well, Larry, Grady should know. Yeah, so you'd think. But the tracks I saw out there, they don't belong to any kind of cat that I've ever seen. Well, if you would, uh, I'd consider it a personal favor if you'd go back out there with me and have a look. I mean, Grady's good, but everyone knows you're the best. <sighs> sure, uh, let me get my hat and coat. 
and as he's putting on his coat, he smiled at Kate. Yeah, get the boys up and dress. Lock the house up. He looked at Larry. Yeah, put my 1911 Colt 45 in your purse. And take the boys and go to your sister's house for the day. If she's not home, go to the AOK motel and get a room. How are you getting to town? I ride with Larry. No back talk. I'll be with you as soon as I can. He gave her a quick kiss and he was out the door with the sheriff. As Sheriff Larry Cahill pulled his car up and looked at the scene unfolding before his eyes. Game wardens from two adjoining counties. A state trooper by the name of Talbot and his junior partner, Trooper Reed. Even a county constable who was contaminating most of the crime scene. Word had spread like wildfire after Steve's friends discovered his body lying smoldering in his campfire. Dozens of people were milling around, contaminating any evidence. What kind of circus is this? Cahill shouted. Who the hell let all these people in here? Get them out! Get them out! This is not... Cahill shouted. The damn carnival sideshow. Get all these people out of here. If they refuse to leave, arrest them for loitering. Lord God Almighty, show the deceased some freaking respect. Will had climbed out of the sheriff's car and was watching and listening. The senior state trooper walked over to Cahill. And this was Trooper Talbot. He had a good reputation as a good man, a fair trooper. Well, I'm sorry, Larry. Well, get him out of here, even if we have to charge some with obstruction of justice. The county commoner's done with the body. I was about to release it. Well, before you release it, I'd like Will to have a look at it first, Lara. Talbot agreed and walked with Will towards the body, which was now on a gurney, covered with a blanket. As they walked, Trooper Talbot asked Will if he'd ever wondered why a deceased person's body was referred to as remains. Will cocked his head and replied he hadn't ever given it much thought. Talbot replied grimly, Yeah, you will. And the county coroner nodded to Will as they approached the body. Talbot accepted a face mask and rubber gloves from the doctor. Will accepted a face mask and gloves also. And Talbot spoke to Will. Ah, it's like nothing I've ever seen before, Will. Ah, are you ready? Uh, no, but Larry thinks I might be able to help. So, uh, let's get on with it. The tablet pulled the blanket back and the smell of burnt flesh assailed them. He paused for a second or two to regain his composure. It was his head still, on side when he got here, Doc. Well, he was torn up pretty good. A lot of jagged marks around where the neck and head used to be. Okay, I see now I think I want to see. The stage remains were covered and the coroner asked Hill if they could remove the body. Cahill gave his approval, but will stop the coroner. Uh, Doc, when you got here, did you happen to collect his internal organs? Why, no. What happened to his internal organs? His guts. His head was still here. And Grady Williams, the state game warden, walked up and commented. Uh, they're probably spread all over these woods. Predators like to carry some food with them. Cats will take it up a tree. And bears will bear it. What's your reason for being here anyway. Ah, he's here as a personal favour to me, Grady, said Cahill. And Will had moved away and was studying what tracks he could find, which had not been contaminated. And Talbot and Trooper Reed joined him. Ah, anything. I know all these people out here really hindered this investigation. Ah, hindered, said Cahill, as he joined them. They ruined every track out here. Well, it doesn't matter, Sheriff. You don't have to be looking for some lunatic running around with a chainsaw. You don't have to put out a bounty on a killer bear or even a cougar. Well, now the great tracker and local legend has solved the case for us. So tell us, Nimrod, what or who killed Steve Cox? Grady Williams stood grinning, his arms folded across his chest. He was enjoying this a bit too much. Uh, you're right, Grady. I am going to tell you. Uh, we're waiting. Something big. Strong, fast. Something that has sharp teeth. A lot of sharp teeth. And claws. Big, sharp claws. So, he laughed. Well, we're looking for Bigfoot? Ha <laughs> ha! I knew he was going to say Bigfoot! Talbot shook his head in disgust. Grady, you stupid, egotistic son of a bitch. Never said or mentioned Bigfoot. And Trooper Reed retorted. Nope, he never did. 
And then Will rode in Silas back into town with Sheriff Cahill. In fact, Will had spoken a word once they were in the Sheriff's car. Cahill glanced over at William, and he cleared his throat. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Will. I didn't do anything. If I could have seen one clear track. No, Larry, I didn't help much at all. But you don't think a rogue cougar found his way here and poor old Steve was just at the wrong place at the wrong time? No, nope, not even a bear. No cougar, no bear. No Bigfoot, no lunatic. Like I said. Who then what? A booger. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Fantastic to take a trip down memory lane and start working my way through these incredible stories once again. I hope you guys enjoy that one as much as I and David. And of course, a huge thank you to David for once again joining us on the channel. As always, Dave, I hope you enjoyed this rendition and can't wait to jump into some of the newer adventures that I know you are penning. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and even better New Year's. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you have a story to share with us or would just like to get in touch, then please do at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As I said before, I hope you all had a fantastic Christmas with friends or family and an even better New Year's, lots of food and even better drink. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.